Well hello there fellow BitFlickers, this is your pal Al here and I'm here today to tell you about my IBM PC, the retro hot rod that it is. Let's take the lid off and have a look inside and see what the PC can really do. Now this is the PC in question, this is my one, it's the PCXT5160, the uh, second model of the PC. It looks identical to the first one, but the XT usually came with a hard disk drive, which is that panel over there to the right hand side. And you can see there's a big space there, where there's no hard drive in there, but let's, let's, let's zoom in into this very dusty, disgusting looking case, and you can see there's 6th September 1985 is the date on this machine. So the original PC came out in 1981, so this one is a slightly newer model. Um, inside, you can see lots and lots of cards and stuff, and you can see this distinctly empty bay, as I was saying, which is where the hard drive used to be. Well, it's um, it died long, long ago. Um, you can see I've soldered a little cable up the side there. I put lots of sticky tape. Um, maybe tidy that up one of these days. Never. This little box in the corner here is a Raspberry Pi. Raspberry Pi 2. Now why have I put that in there? Well, because I want to be able to SSH into Linux and make it look like I'm actually using Linux on the IBM PC XT. More on that later. Anyway, uh, I've got a bunch of cards in this machine and uh, I'll go on through those in a bit as well and tell you what they're all about. Uh, but this machine here is a standard XT, so the whole purpose of this video is to show you uh, how to hot rod a machine like this using only stock components. So basically if I ripped all these cards out later on, the PC would be back to its standard old 4.77 megahertz glory. That's not very fast. This particular PC here has 640 kilobytes of RAM, 256 kilobytes is on the motherboard. And this card here on the left hand side, this very long thing here, it's called an AST 6-pack plus. It has another 512k RAM on it to bring the whole PC up to the maximum these PCs could have, which is 640k. You know, look in the back here, you can see that it's got a, a mouse cable connected to it, and that's... Um, really nasty looking mouse I have. But uh, yeah, it's on a 25 pin serial port, which is uh, a multi-card. So it's got not, it's got a whole bunch of things on this card. There's the RAM there, as I was talking about, the 512 case, fully loaded card. And uh, it's also got a real time clock on it, as well as um, some IO ports. Yes, yeah, see, see there, there we go. 64 to 256 kilobyte system board. So this one was fully tripped out with all the system RAM. Look at it, all that lovely modules of RAM. Mmm, great. Very slow RAM as well. Back in those days, RAM wasn't very fast. Okay, so now the second card that you see here, uh, this one is the uh, display card. It's not a VGA as you'd be used to, it's a EGA card. Now the reason I've gone with the EGA card and not used the VGA card is I like to keep it compatible with this, the uh, 5160's original monitor. It's a CGA monitor, but I'm gonna show you I can use it with the EGA card. So the thing about the CGA display, the IBM PC, 5153. Well, CGA was just a bit hmm, shit. Uh, let's be honest, it had two colors when you, re you ran it in um, its uh, highest resolution mode, which was 640 by 200 whole pixels, basically like a postage stamp. And then you had um, its uh, lower resolution mode of 320 by 200, which gave you four lovely picture, pixel colors. So on the left, you can see Commander Keen in its CGA four color glory mode. And on the right hand side, you can see the same resolution, that's 320 by 200, if not mistaken, in EGA. And you can see the color depth at 16 colors. So big difference, and the colors were always quite sharp, I thought. So I guess what you could say is that, yep, that's hot rod hack number one. So, yes, you could say that this hack has been a success, but do bear in mind one thing. The uh, EGA monitors always supported the full resolution of the EGA signal, which was 640 by 320. This old monitor here, the CGA one, I don't think would take very kindly to me pushing that kind of super high resolution graphics through it. And uh, I think I've tried it before and it gets pretty upset about things. So, yes, most of the time, fortunately, the graphics that uh, go through through this display, even though they're in EGA color, 
they are still within the uh, usual bounds of the 640 by 200 resolution. That's why most game developers and so forth didn't bother making games higher than that resolution because a lot of them had CGA still. Uh, so you can see it uh, working away. Uh, this is a program called Check It and um, it's doing hard disk test. Now you may have noticed that there was a distinct lack of a hard disk drive sitting in the computer. So you may ask yourself, how or how is it checking the hard disk drive? Now, going over here, you can see the hard drive light flashing away, and we all know that there's no hard drive there. Could this be hot rod hack number two? I've got a little piece of dodgy cable inside in one of my most horrific hacks yet, which takes the uh, a piece of cable to that light on the front which used to be the front fascia for the hard drive I've got that soldered in there really nicely as you can see running up through the side of the case and then over here to something which you just can't make out let's go around this way okay yep mm -hmm, mm -hmm. right there there's a little flashing light on there can you see the the light um, flashing by the cable that I put in well, that's on the special card, which I'm going to talk about in just a minute. So anyway, we've seen the second card, which was the EJ card. This fairly long card with the blue thing coming out of it. That is the floppy disk controller. It serves one purpose, one purpose only. is to look after this behemoth of a box with all these chips on it, uh, which takes floppy disks in the front. I always thought these looked a lot cooler than the, uh, the AT equivalent, which uh, came along a lot later. It's a big chunky beast you can see here. Uh, makes a lovely sound when you do that. Uh, anyway, um, yes, the, 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 the ones that came after it with the AT were, um, were certainly a lot thinner. They were half the height of these ones. These like to get some dust in them and, you know, get themselves all disgusting. But yeah, love them, love them. All right, let's go over to the other side of the case, back again, and let's have a look at the next card. Okay, let's try and zoom in on this one. Right, some of you might remember this card. It's called the Sound Blaster, and this one is, I believe, the Sound Blaster version 2. So just one version better than the beginning version, right? CT1350B, to be precise. Um, and the Sound Blaster card was like an, the AdLib card, but only better. It had some better sounds, I thought. It sounded a lot better. Um, and round the back, let's have a look at what they look like um, so at the bottom you had a joystick port so you plug your joystick in and the next thing above that is the um, 3.5 mil output jack on top of that there's a volume slider on top of that there's a microphone input and I think another input as well after that but this little um, 3.5 millimeter uh, jack comes out I've done another little hack here I made a horrible cable which goes um, into the side of the computer and it's inside on this little piezo based um, speaker which I've got stuck against the uh, the power supply by magnet oh that's a nasty little hack and the cable running out of there runs into the side of the panel which is in a space where I used to it used to have a, a battery backup so that before the um, ASD six pack was in there it would have a battery in there and you can see this power supply has actually come off of an another PCXT um, and you can see that another battery sitting there has um, erupted all over the side of this power supply. You can see even the thick steel here, it's been eroded all over that particular power supply and if it had been left for much longer then the fate of this power supply would be like the power supply that was in this before. Okay, bit flickers, this one's a biggie. The next card off the rank is the 3C503, the 3Com network card. And in this particular case, it's a 3C50316 TP. That means that this one's a 16 bit card. Now, if we, if we try and pan down a bit um, in a moment, I'll, I'll show you. Uh, that it's yeah it is a 16-bit card now bear in mind that the PC and the PC XT were exactly the same motherboards and they were absolutely 8-bit motherboards they had only space for 8-bit cards and yet here we have a 16-bit card sitting in the bay and you'll be able to see round the side of it that it's just kind of hanging off the side that last 16 the last 16 bits there are just kind of hanging off the side um, 
So this this is a network card anyway. That that's the most important thing about this. It's quite exciting because this card here brings you on to an Ethernet network. Yes, with a with a PCXT, it is possible to get it on some sort of network. You can talk to other computers, you can go on the internet, you can do things that you possibly couldn't have even dreamed of doing in 1981 when it was a reality. Anyway, that's the card. I will show you it in operation later on in there. There you go, there you can see there the 16-bit, the, uh, bit, the, the bit of the, the bottom of the card just hanging off the side there. Those, those are supposed to be in the motherboard, those those golden tips, uh, but they're not because um, the card also works in 8-bit mode, and that's the the great thing about this card. Um, so yeah, it, it can sit there quite happily inside an IBM PC XT and give you all your 8-bit network goodness. Now, I'm not being rude here, but I'll take you around the back, and I'll uh, I'll show you. There you go. There's your Ethernet connector right there, as well as an AUI transceiver. Okay, so the next bay is empty, but the one thereafter is quite an interesting one. This here, this blue card that you see, is a compact flash, a CFXT card. It's quite interesting because it allows you to connect uh, a, um, a modern hard drive, an IDE type hard drive, but it also allows you to connect two compact flash uh, cards in there, so your normal memory cards that you put in an, um, an SLR type camera. You can see one uh, CF card kicking out the back of the computer and uh, there's also the space on the other side for the uh, the other card as well if you wanted to do it. But that means you can detach the card anytime, take it to another machine, a much more modern one like your PC or your Mac and plug it in and then copy software onto it. So just about down there you can see the compact flash kicking out. Yep, there you go. So the great thing here is that all these old PCs, they all came with MFM hard drives and, and those hard drives just don't last. They, they die pretty quickly. So the great thing is that you can use a compact flash card here and emulate having a hard drive just as if it was 1981 all over again. So the great thing as well is that the capacity of these is in the gigabytes rather than the tens of megabytes. Okay, now we're on to our final card of the uh, machine. So almost all of the slots have been tricked out. Uh, I think there's eight slots in a PCXT instead of five in the PC. And this is the eighth slot right here. And in it, it's got this card here with uh, pretty much bugger all around the back, just this little toggle switch. Hmm, what does that do? Toggle, toggle, toggle. You can see it's flipped up. That means it's in turbo mode. Now, when PC XT clones came out, they were often uh, faster than the original PC, which was rated at 4.77 megahertz. Now, that was a pretty slow clock speed even then. And the clone PC came, came out, they were often called Turbo XTs because they could run at speeds of typically 8 to maybe even 10 megahertz, depending on which chip they had. Some of them were completely compatible with the IBM PC XT, and some of them were not. So you, you had to be careful about the chips that you bought. One of them was called the V20, which was made by, um, I think it was made by AMD. Now, everybody knows that realistically, there was only so much Lotus 1, 2, 3 that dad could do when it got down to it. Everybody wanted to play games with the PC, and this 4.77 megahertz processor really did not cut it. So the AT came out, it was the next machine after this, and it had either a I think it was an 8, a 10, or a 12 megahertz CPU, and that was based on the IBM, uh, sorry, the Intel 80286 chip. Now, like the 80286, the 286 is a 16-bit processor, but um, it only came with the AT. But you can have a look at this chip. You can see on the left-hand side of the picture, and you can see this is Intel 82, and it's an 80286-N. Um, I believe that that is a 8 megahertz CPU, so that's basically a 286 or an AT class processor sitting there in an IBM XT. What's going on here? All right, so it is. It's some kind of witchcraft. Uh, you can see to the right of the uh, CPU chip, there's an 80287 math coprocessor as well. And then further down, you can see this little ribbon cable. Um, now, it's connected to the motherboard in the slot, the, the, the chip bay, where the 8088 CPU that, that exists. So the original CPU, the 8088, which was 4.77 megahertz. To its right, it's very difficult to see here, but to its right, uh, there is also a um, the little bay, and that's for the original 808 
7 math call processor. So um, this basically the ribbon cable is connected uh, to the empty socket bay. It goes up there onto the daughter board and you can see just um, just where the top of that ribbon cable is there's another um, or the, sorry the bottom of that ribbon cable you can see a chip just below there that chip is the original IBM uh, XT8088 CPU and the toggle switch on the back allows you to toggle between the 286 there and the 8088 chip so it works extremely well, gives you the best of two worlds. There you go, there's a little bit of a zoom in, and you can see, well, I think one of those legs is a bit loose there, it's a bit far out. But anyway, it works very well, allows you to flip between the 8286 CPU and the 8088 uh, CPU. You may be wondering why you would swap between a fast processor to a slow processor again. Reason being is that sometimes applications were programmed to use the CPU clock, and that meant when they were on the 286, they would run far too fast. Now, as you're going to see in just a moment, you're going to see the big difference between applications running on an 8088 CPU versus an 80286 CPU. It really does make this machine a completely different beast, makes it much more usable and gives you some games that you just couldn't play before because it would just be like playing with treacle. So what I have here is I've got everything boxed back up and I'm running the landmark uh, PC system test. Now what this does is it tests a system against the typical speed of an IBM PC AT. So I've got this in XT mode, I've flipped this, the turbo switch back down, so this is running the, the standard CPU of the PC XT. For some reason it thinks it's an NEC V20. There's a possibility that the CPU I have in there is actually a V20 and not a original 8088. But you can see there that it reckons that against an AT it performs at 2.13 megahertz. Um, so that's, that's in comparison to an AT. It's not the speed that's actually running it. It also says there's no floating point unit, so it's no mass coprocessor and the video is 411 characters per second. All right, so I've popped the uh, CPU back into turbo mode, switching the 80286 processor on. So this time it should be running a bit more uh, around the same speed as the IBM PC AT. See right there that it performs like a 7 megahertz AT with a 10 megahertz 80287 coprocessor. So really, the machine is performing pretty much like an IBM AT machine. And that makes this whole thing a lot more usable. All right, so um, I just thought I'd show you this quickly. I've booted up the machine here, and you can see uh, various things up on the top of the boot screen. So first of all, there is a blue line up there. It says A, um, FDD, C, and then a few other things as well. So the A drive is the floppy disk. Um, it'll boot if you press A on startup, and if you press C, it'll boot from the compact flash disk. Um, so all of this is part of the BIOS, which is hooked into um, by that compact flash system. Um, and then the uh, the next option will give you a boot menu, and then uh, the, the next option will give you the boot ROM, uh, which is actually the original PCXT BIOS, so I think that boots you to basic. Um, so yeah, that, that gives you, that that's a little extra hook that's in the BIOS made by the XT IDE uh, compact flash uh, card that's in there. You can see next um, uh, that it's, uh, it's at 300x in the system RAM. So fourth, it's a two gig card. And then the next thing is it starts off the config sys and the auto exec bat. It'll load, load the uh, AST clock. Now, if you remember the AST six pack plus, which is the, the first card that I showed you in the machine, this here is the clock part of that. And it's showing you that it's set the uh, current date and time. And if you notice the date there is saying 1999, well, that's because the software itself wasn't compatible with the year 2000. So it had the millennium bug in there, but it, MS-DOS interprets the time correctly, so the real-time clock on that AST card actually works properly. It's just that the software doesn't. MS-DOS, however, says it's all good. 
Okay, well, next up, I'm going to show you this part, which, well, it's basically my favorite part. It's about networking on the IBM PC, a 4.77 megahertz PC with 640 kilobytes of RAM getting itself on the internet. So I've got a few files in this folder call and the folder called net um, and some of these uh, I've had success with and some of these utilities well I've had less success with okay so the tools that I'm going to show you here are made by a guy called Michael Brutman brutman.com forward slash mtcp these tools came out in 2015 although I believe the guy who's a genius by the way an absolute genius he's working away on them here in 2019 so make sure you check it out okay so here is a list on brutman.com of all the tools that you get with the mtcp stack First of all, you get DHCP, which is really handy because you don't want to statically configure an IP address on the network every single time. This one here gets an IP address from your wireless router or whatever it is, uh, it puts it on your own home network. Then there's the FTP client. Now, that's really handy because what you can do with that is you could FTP to uh, an FTP server, which you might set up on your home PC, and then copy files across from the FTP server on your PC to your XT or your PC here, your old machine. So that's really handy. Uh, I use that all the time rather than pulling out the compact flash card in the back of the XT and then putting it into my Mac and then transferring the files. Sneaker net is never good. Okay, so uh, it also does an FTP server so it can act, act as the host for copying files too if you want to do it the other way around. HTGET will download, it's very rudimentary, but it will download web pages. Um, there's HDB server which will serve up web pages so basically your own XT could become a web server that's crazy um, then there's IRC Junior which I'm going to show you in just a minute its ability to chat on the internet is just insane uh, Netcat if you've used it then you'll know what it's all about Ping well you know what Ping is packet tools a packet sniffer uh, SNTPs for um, your, you know, getting time services and stuff like that from the internet. And finally, there is Telnet, which is an incredibly useful tool to have on this. And I use it to connect to a Linux box, um, the Raspberry Pi inside, which I'll show you in just a minute as well. Really, really handy tools and they work really, really well. Okay, so configuration for this uh, bunch of TCP tools is done just via one config file um, and there's a sample config file called sample.cfg in the directory with them. Uh, so it, it doesn't really need a quick start as it says here in the guidelines but it's most of the config file is pretty self-explanatory and here's some basic steps it says this is in the readme this is one load the packet driver for your ethernet card i'll come to that in a moment but basically the packet driver for all intents and purposes is just a normal device driver uh, number two is then to create the configuration file which i said can be taken from the sample one then you set up an environment variable in the auto exec bat for example mtcp cfg and then you just run the program. Now, as I said a moment ago, running a packet driver is uh, one of the prerequisites. Now, packet driver, if you look at www.brutman.com forward slash DOS underscore networking forward slash DOS underscore networking dot HTML, as it says here, that's a great resource to help you set up your network card. Auto exec first. So in there you can see all the other settings I've made uh, but they're pretty basic but you can see um, MTCP CFG I've set the config file to be tcp.cfg so let's have a look at that one first of all so this file's been taken from the sample.cfg file I've just called it tcp.cfg and as I'll show you in just a second it's pretty much stock standard I haven't changed very much I've just changed the settings to suit my needs I'll take it to the top again. So first of all, packet int 0 times 60. That is the location in RAM memory where the packet driver can be found. So it will look at um, uh, interrupt 060, um, or 60, sorry, uh, to find the packet driver. 
you may want to set an MTU. There's an example here, the default's 1500. I typically don't unless you're having a problem with uh, transmission. I've just set the host name as well to XT3C503, just something arbitrary so I can identify it on the network. IRC Junior is part of the tools that you get with this, and of course you can choose a default nickname as well. There's a whole bunch of other options that you can choose with that, uh, as well as FTP, of course, there are um, transmission sizes, and then there's the Telnet options as well, the FTP server details, all of that stuff can be configured within here. Uh, and then right at the bottom of the file, you can see the DHCP settings. That's what the uh, IP address of the machine has actually been set to. So this will automatically be updated every time you run the DHCP command. Going straight along now to the packet driver. If you remember, I talked about this a moment ago. Here I've got a little batch file, um, which has, amongst other things, the configuration of the packet driver. First thing I do there is set mtcpcfg sql net tcp.conf. That's um, actually superfluous because I made that setting already in the auto exec bat, but it's there just for completeness anyway. Next line down is the important one, and that is the packet driver itself. 3C503 is the exe file that is the actual packet driver program. The next is 0 times 60, which if you remember from the config file for TCP, is the address, the memory address of the, um, the, 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 the network card itself. And that's set on a jumper. So if I have a quick look at the 3C503 drive, the program itself, you can see the different options. Um, the packet interrupt number is the next specification, the IRQ, the interrupt request, the IO address, and if it's, if it's desired, the cable type. So you can see the packet interrupt is, um, is, is 060, the hardware IRQ is 3, the IO address is 0 times 250 hexadecimal, and the cable type is 1, the cable type 1 being Ethernet. So yeah, once it runs the 3C503, it then goes and does a DHCP. First of all, we have to do 3C503, 0 times 60. So that will um, set the uh, interrupt um, to 60. We'll use IRQ3, so that's hardware set, that's on the jumper for the, the network card. So you choose the IRQ using a jumper on the card itself. Um, then you choose the I.O. address. Again, that should be on the jumper on the card. So 0 times 250. And then finally, you can, you can choose uh, one. So let's do that. So there you go. Now, once you've done that, you can run the TCP commands. So um, first of all, let's get an IP address. It's going to speak to the DHCP server which is my Wi-Fi router, and you can see the IP address has been given to it by um, the gateway, which is the, the Wi-Fi router that's here. It writes it to the TCP config file, which we uh, set earlier on, and now we're good to go with, um, with using Telnet or something like that. So I'll log in. You can see that it found straight away the IP address of the host name, which is Pi Ethernet. If I just tap the uh, return key a few times, it will uh, spring to life. So we're actually talking to the Pi, the Raspberry Pi, inside this machine here. So it's kind of kind of nice that way. I'll log in, and there we're inside the Raspberry Pi. Note that it's got a nice green color because it's um, it's using a full ANSI. Uh, client. Um, you can do things like browse the web. Uh, so here, here is us going to Google, and you can see the sort of speed that we're doing this. Now, obviously, all of this is through the Raspberry Pi. We're not actually um, uh, we're not we're not actually doing this on the local XT, but it has the feel of it anyway. So that's kind of that's kind of nice. There's many other applications that you can use. So for example, you can use um, Twitter. Here's a way to use um, Twitter on, um, on the machine, um, which is pretty cool. So you can use Twitter, you can use um, email via Pine or Mutt. Uh, so just give you um, an idea of what that looks like. 
I should point out at this time that those Google people are getting too clever. They're trying to tell me that I need to secure things. So I had to go to myaccount.google.com forward slash less secure apps to switch this feature on to allow me to look at my Gmail whilst I'm on my XT. So now that I've done that, I'll run the Pine program. Now there is another program called Mutt, which is also great, uh, but I thought I'd give you a shot with this one. It's quite easy to configure. It's all menu based and so forth. Here's me in the message in index, which is basically my inbox. And you can see me going through mm -hmm. rifling all my emails there. Um, and this is kind of what an email looks like in text mode. Uh, it's not pretty uh, because most of the emails that come to you these days have got HTML in them and all sorts of other things. But in most cases, the emails are still readable. And there's me going to a link in a web browser, uh, which is an exciting terms and conditions page. But there you go. You get the g general gist of things. Yes, you can read your emails. Yes, you can browse the web all in text mode, but it's still cool, right? So we've been doing all of this in, uh, in a Telnet session onto a Linux box. What I'm about to show you here is a native program called IRC Junior, and it's for internet relay chat. I'll show you how to do that. So all I did there is type in IRC Junior, and then the IRC server that I wanted to get on. And in this case, it's irc.slashnet.org. And I did hash VC, which is this channel uh, for um, vintage computing. And you can see me typing away there and saying hello to people and so forth. And that's just just as easy as that, just typing away to people and having fun just like it's 1987 all over again. But there's lots of people, there's millions of people still chatting away on IRC. So if you don't know about IRC, I suggest you look it up. Hours of endless fun. Okay, so I just wanted to demonstrate EGA graphics um, on the CGA monitor. Um, and this game also has audio um, by a guy called uh, David, and he's from 8-Bit uh, Productions, a really clever guy, um, David Murray. Uh, he's called the 8-Bit Guy. You should search for him on uh, YouTube. But anyway, uh, here's, here's his game that he made, and this is a really um, recent um, game. It was made in 2019. So there you can see the EGA artwork. And that's um, ad lib. So the audio you're hearing there that audio is um, that audio is ad lib quality. So the quality of the audio that you can get out of this uh, this sound card is uh, actually just a little bit better than that. But it just goes to show there that you can get nice digital audio. Well, I hope you've enjoyed watching this short video on the use of the IBM PC 5160 as a hot rodded machine. I'll leave you with a bit of Monkey Island, one of the best games ever. And it's running at pretty good speed. Any questions please hit me up in the comments. Thanks for watching.